As we get ready to come back on, just a, a few seconds to go here, I want to uh, ask our, our panelists for our ACHP traditional knowledge paper and the Saving Our Stories to go ahead and bring themselves up on video. Um, but you can keep yourselves muted for the time being. Oh, and I see that you are all here, so, so thank you. Uh, and it is right now just the dot of 10 o'clock, so I want to I uh, just have one quick reminder for those who are just now joining us who missed uh, the opening instructions. If you are an attendee, we would appreciate you putting your questions into the question box. If you are a panelist, you may not be able to use the question box for questions. Uh, if that's the case, it's okay to go ahead and put that into uh, the comment box. And we also had somebody ask a question uh, during the last panel about where people can find the slideshows and any documents related to the panels. We will be collecting all of that information and making it available uh, on our Paul Environmental Department website. We have a page for the summit and that's where all of our recordings will go, all of our uh, panel information will go. And if you are interested in the agenda, that agenda is also posted on the PED website. So I will throw that into the chat box in just a moment. Uh, but now I want to introduce our next panel. And that is the, uh, the ACHP traditional knowledge paper is, is what we're calling it. And we also have Sonia Tamez, who is from the California Institute for Community Art and Nature. She is working on a terrific project called Saving Our Stories about collecting and archiving California Indian stories. So she's also going to give a presentation. Uh, but we have uh, Amy Giorgiani, who is the chair of the ACHP, and also Valerie Hauser and Ira Matt, who are staff with the ACHP and have been working very hard on the traditional knowledge paper and will be presenting on that. Uh, but first, I want to give uh, Chairman Gior Giorgiani the opportunity to introduce herself because she's pretty new to the ACHP and uh, I think Amy I, this is your first chance to say hello to our California TIPOs and cultural staff so take it away. There we go my unmute button was not cooperating. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that is on. Um, so thank you so much Shasta and of course there's sawing that started right as I'm about to speak. <laughs> oh my God, it's never ending. Okay. All right, hopefully this is working. Yes. Okay, great. It's never ending here. Um, the joys of virtual lear learning and working. Um, thank you so much, uh, Shasta, uh, for inviting me to speak today. Um, I, I uh, kind of uh, listened into the uh, session that was just earlier today. Um, and um, Appreciated hearing um, from that, and I suppose these headphones will help too, so that my dog doesn't have a squeaking goat <laughs> in the background that you pulled up. Um, so, uh, first of all, I'm praying for rain relief and safety for all of you in California. Um, I, I, it's so hard to believe um, I was just there at this time a year ago. Um, uh, so much has changed for you all in just this past year since the last time you met. Um, in this forum. Um, I, I think I was there just shortly thereafter. Um, and uh, it, it's just so hard to believe. I saw the maps and what was going on, just where I had been, and, and it's awful. Um, this year's uh, theme, cultural justice for tribes, uh, really resonates with the work of the ACHP and my goals um, as chairman of the advisory council. Um, I began my service here in July of 2019. Um, and shortly thereafter, um, began visits with Indian country. Uh, just a few weeks in, um, I started with a, a visit to a tribe in my home state of Wisconsin, Lac de Flambeau, um, and then later went to a Confederated uh, Salish and Kootenai tribes in Montana, Suquamish in Washington state, and um, then did a big trip in New Mexico, Taos, Santa Ana Pueblo, um, met with all public council of governors, um, in the past, I've been to uh, Acoma Pueblo, um, gosh, some 15 years ago, which is hard to believe, uh, and engaged uh, tribes previously um, uh, through work with the Preserve America Initiative um, quite some time back. And um, 
when I was in California last year, um, hosted by Reno Franklin, our um, ACHP tribal member, um, and someone I'm sure <laughs> many of you know, um, uh, Reno organized a, a very informative meeting uh, for me in Shasta, um, Paul Macaro, Rose uh, Claiborne, and Julie Polanco, of course. Um, and together we, we, we toured uh, Fort Ross uh, and then visited a property of, of great importance to the Kashaya Como people um, that was newly required um, by the tribe and just such a great success story on that end. And just a really special day for um, that Reno shared these, these places with us and, um, and it was wonderful Shasta to fly all the way up north um, to meet with us for the day. Um, all of those visits uh, and meetings really helped both educate me and um, and hard in my resolve uh, to ensure the ACHP continues to support our, our tribal partners and um, in their quest to protect cultural heritage. Uh, I'm also extremely lucky to be working with Valerie Hauser, um, Bill Dancing Feather, and Ira Matt in our office um, as well. Um, as being the first full-time chair, um, I, I get to benefit from them um, in theory being down the hall for me, at least it used to be the case <laughs> until we all um, moved virtually for the time being. Um, but uh, I can't say that a previous chairman has had um, been able to gain from, from, from that, um, like I am able to on a daily basis. Um, to that end, I've met with, um, we've met with White House staff um, and several, in, many interior, in Department of the Interior officials uh, to talk about ways to advance uh, tribal and Native Hawaiian preservation goals um, and continue to advocate for Native peoples with other federal officials as well and through our our, our work on a, a couple of interagency task force. Um, the ACHP launched, of course, um, training for federal agencies and applicants about early coordination with tribes as well as Section 106 training for Native Hawaiian organizations. Um, they seem to be getting great response and great uh, rates of participation. Uh, we are working on similar online training for Indian tribes and have begun um, hosting virtual training sessions for, for tribes in this day and age of all things virtual. Um, the ACHP is, is, is deep into its initiative um, to educate the historic preservation world about traditional knowledge and is doing that in collaboration with tribal nations and Native Hawaiian organizations. And you'll be hearing about that with the theme of this hour um, in just a moment. Um, I, uh, I think we had a few listening sessions over the summer and I was um, uh, grateful to be able to, uh, to listen into one of those. Um, uh, in closing, just wanna let you all know that I um, come completely agree with the statements in the introduction to the summit that uh, it, it is more important than ever for tribes to have their voices heard and for the state and, uh, and federal governments to meet tribes in the spirit of cooperation, commitment, and respect. Um, I will continue to do all of my power as ACHP chairman um, to work to, to try to strive for this and reach this goal. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Shasta, for inviting me to uh, do this today. I'm constantly amazed with the many hats that you wear. Um, and uh, I will pass it back over to you. Thank you uh, so much, Amy. And, uh, you know, since you mentioned that there was, uh, you know, the sounds of, of saws in the background, just acknowledging that we're all coming from different places. Right now, a lot of people in their in their homes, and sometimes the internet can be a little shaky. Uh, you can always turn off your video if you think that the the internet connection is going to get bad. So at least we can we can hear folks. But uh, Sonia called me about uh, ten minutes into the break to to say that um, there was just an earthquake up in uh, the Bay Area. So not a big one apparently. She said it was a jolt. Um, and that always scares me, actually. When I feel just a jolt, instead of being grateful that it was a small earthquake, I always wonder, was that really a small earthquake or was it a huge one and I was just too far away to feel the effects? So uh, not having heard anything from anybody else, I'm assuming that it was just a small jolt. Uh, but uh, hopefully those of you up in that area, um, hey, if you felt it, uh, throw it into the, to the chat box and then let us know where you are and if you, if you felt that little jolt. So yeah, just, just what we need, right? Uh, plagues, earthquakes, and wildfires. <laughs> so in any case, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and uh, throw it over to Valerie and to Ira, who are going to give us a presentation on what they've done with the traditional knowledge paper. 
Thanks, Shasta. Um, I just want to say hi to everybody. I'm so sorry we can't gather in person this year. I really enjoyed attending and participating in last year's session, and it's really disappointing I couldn't join you again this year. But um, as Chairman Giorgiani said, I'm you know praying for um, your trials and tribulations to end soon and that everyone stays healthy and safe. Um, Ira will do most of the presentation, so um, and I'll be available for questions. So take it away, Ira. Uh, so halt, Janes, Skelihu, El Salish. I just want to say, you know, good day to everybody. Um, I'm one of the people. I'm Salish, and I just wanted to thank you guys for the opportunity to be here. Um, I too uh, feel for what you guys are going through. If this was 20 years ago, I'd have some boots on the ground, I'd be out fighting fire, but uh, that time's passed. These days I seem to have uh, most of my injuries doing simple things like standing up or sleeping. Um, so firefighting might be a little past, past my time, but uh, where we can help from the advisory council we are, and today we're here to uh, bring forth the traditional knowledge, traditional knowledge initiative. Um, that's a term everybody here is familiar with. A lot of people live it, um, deal with it every day with their elders, with their youth, and just part of their life ways. Um, so it's a little awkward when we're talking about it from a federal agency perspective. Um, hopefully a lot of you folks have been involved with what we've been doing, that you've been a part of our calls, that you've read the papers. Uh, so you know where we're going with it, but we've got a short presentation here, fairly basic to just walk everybody through. And we wanna leave as much time as possible for just questions and answers um, and clarification. So I'm gonna attempt to share my screen here. Um, and we'll see if I can do it properly. Do you guys see a presentation? We do. All right, all right, all right. Now I just got to... Uh, Let's see if I can actually, oh, I should have had it all set up to, to view. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you always got to be careful not to put any any notes that are too salacious, you know, because people might see those. <laughs> oh, I guess I will. <laughs> notes like, know. you know, remember to put on pants before starting presentation. <laughs> I don't know, I'm just, I'm getting nervous. I got to push buttons. I do this all the time. <laughs> um, so traditional knowledge, it's our educational initiative. And you'll see a little bit more about why we're speaking to education. Uh, versus moving into guidance or, or some of the other things. It's been a bit of a back and forth with that. Um, but essentially what we're doing is we're developing that information paper about traditional knowledge specific to the Section 106 process. Uh, and we're doing that in consultation with Indian tribes, Native Hawaiians, Native Hawaiian organizations. But I, I don't even think in consultation uh, does it justice. Essentially, we are relying on tribes and Native Hawaiians to take the lead on this because the ACHP can't and essentially won't put this out uh, without that participation, which we've had. And I want to start off addressing that information paper. It is. It's informational. Uh, we're not really telling anybody anything they have to do beyond what they already know, but we decided to, to work on that foundation is what we're looking at this as. We got to make sure everybody understands what we're talking about, what tribes are talking about, and that we're all on the same page before we take that next step. And just from my perspective, um, the reason that the ACHP is doing this is the tribal indigenous perspectives um, and non-indigenous people, they already have two distinct worldviews. On top of this, now you're taking this indigenous worldview and you're trying to bring it in and filter it into a regulatory legal process that especially when it was initially drafted did not include Indian tribes. So there's a lot uh, of information I think that uh, the tribes contain, the Native Hawaiians contain, that the agencies don't have, but there's also uh, a whole understanding um, and uh, a respect component of it too that we're trying to build by starting off with an information paper. And we'll work on this, I'll jump to the second bullet here, because we identified a need to educate the participants about the importance 
tribal and native Hawaiian knowledge in the process. Because as most of you guys know, uh, tribal histories, tribal lifeways, past, present, and the same with native Hawaiians, uh, they aren't things that are part of the mainstream education. Uh, the lifeways aren't. And so there are people who just lack knowledge. There are people who might lack respect for it. Um, it's kind of all over the place. One of the things that really got us moving on it uh, was in response to the United Nations, uh, who had a permanent forum on indigenous issues, where they were focusing really worldwide on indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, its role, uh, the rights of the people. It's something that the Advisory Council participated in, uh, and we have information about it on our webpage. The main message from this initial paper that we're doing, it's, it's about respect for traditional knowledge in the 106 process. Um, it's the designated tribal and native Hawaiian representatives are the experts. Moving some stuff around on my screen here. Um, that's more than, than just a simple respect of, you know, try to admire this traditional knowledge. We talk about respect in the way that traditional knowledge has a role in the Section 106 process. Uh, the designation of the Native Hawaiian and tribal experts, that builds back off of the 92 amendments to the NHPA. It builds back to that sovereignty component of the Indian tribes. And this was the first big step I think that the NHP had done. There were other smaller steps, but in particular, those 92 amendments clarified the role of Indian tribes, Native Hawaiians in the 106 process, entitled them to participate as consulting parties uh, when undertakings may affect sites of religious and cultural importance. And it also stated that those sites are eligible for listing on the National Register. This was a key component that happened in the statute. It showed respect for the sovereignty of Indian tribes, their rights to govern, their rights to have tribal historic preservation officers um, to really manage the lands under their own jurisdiction. And um, you can see another important component that came out of that, and, and Bill Dancing Feather did a great job highlighting it here. Federal agencies shall consult. Uh, this language was built into the statute. It's reflected in the regulations in what the advisory council does, but this is statutory language about consultation. And it's one of the things that that consultation process is already difficult enough uh, for agencies to manage, for tribes to participate in with all the competing demands. But backtracking over those last few slides, uh, the reality is that one of the more prominent roles the tribe should have in this process and that is being the experts of their own culture, having that designated representative and including traditional knowledge hasn't always been something that has been effectively incorporated. This varies by region, it varies by agency, it's gonna vary by the tribe and how they elect to share this information. Um, but going back to the front of this, what the ACHP has experienced since not, not only the 1992 amendments to the statute, but from the time the regulations made their incorporations in 1999, 2000, it's been an observation that there's been a lot of inconsistency uh, amongst the agencies and how they're incorporating traditional knowledge and how they're working with Indian tribes. And as I noted, we've observed, we've heard from tribes, from agencies, from Native Hawaiians, there's just not necessarily a central understanding on what exactly traditional knowledge is. And for the advisory council, we are looking at those specifically those properties of religious and cultural significance. I should say not specifically, but in particular. For those of you that are aware, I'm sorry for repeating this, but for those folks who aren't, these site types, these properties of religious and cultural significance to Indian tribes, they're unique to Indian tribes and Native Hawaiians. Other groups aren't able to have properties of religious and cultural significance. And uh, you can compare this to a traditional cultural property. That's something that any group can have. As a matter of fact, uh, if you know, my memory serves me correct, 
most TCPs listed on the National Register are non-tribal. And that's great uh, that everybody's able to use that listing, but it's important uh, for Indian tribes and Native Hawaiians to not only understand that they have this specific role, but it's more important for agencies to understand that the regulations in relation to the statute specifically called out that unique history that Indian tribes and Native Hawaiians have with the landscape, the way that our culture, our spirituality is written into the landscape. And the language within the regulations is special expertise. And it's not quoted necessarily on here with, with quotes, but straight from the regulations, it states that the agency official shall acknowledge that Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations possess special expertise in assessing the eligibility of historic properties that may possess religious and cultural significance to them. It, it, we didn't come out and say it in drafting it. We're coming out and saying it now that that term special expertise means traditional knowledge. That's one of the things that comes out in this information paper to help clarify for federal agencies the role that traditional knowledge has. Um, this is a slide right here that we use in a lot of our trainings. Down below, we list some of the things that our traditional knowledge, you know, indigenous knowledge, place names, oral histories, ethnobotany, simple landscape utilization. Traditional knowledge is a broad topic. What we're looking to do in the 106 process from the advisory council perspective is relate what we meant by special expertise, and we just said that, that it's traditional knowledge. We're relating to the agencies that they need to acknowledge and consider traditional knowledge in the 106 process. And we're all aware that tribes can't make agencies do anything in the 106 process, um, but one of the things that's been lacking in the past is uh, I think a consistent recognition by agencies that they need to actually acknowledge and consider traditional knowledge, that it's on par with the other lines of evidence that they have out there from, you know, archaeology, um, say architectural, and the other information that they take into account. So this information paper looks to take that perspective to raise the awareness. And we've heard it numerous times. This is really a first step in the education of federal agencies. Just what exactly is traditional knowledge and what is its role in the section 106 process? We see the need after this, based on the information that's been shared with us to provide more examples of how agencies and tribes are successfully incorporating it. Um, and then maybe produce a bit more guidance uh, or examples along those lines to help usher along that relationship between the parties. But I believe here, so we, you know, we've seen some examples, um, and this comes from a document produced by the NRCS specifically about ancestral lands. Uh, this document was produced a few years ago. It was a working group that the NRCS had, had put together. I know they had spoken at NAFPO, uh, the annual conference a few times. NAFPO was on the working group, along with the advisory council, several tribal members and NRCS staff. But they did a great job of capturing it in here, the concept that adequate eligibility determinations and assessment of adverse effects necessarily require that sites of religious and cultural significance are identified and, rec and recorded in a manner consistent with the site type. That's going beyond where we're at right now but that's the exact kinds of uh, next steps that we're hoping that the advisory council might be able to take. And again, not us necessarily dictating, but seeing agency actions and guidance documents, um, hearing examples from tribes of successful uh, agreement documents or even working relationships where they've been able to incorporate special expertise. And I believe we have next, yes, an example of a recent PA um, where the tribe, in the end, was pretty happy with the document. I, I speak with them, you know, quite frequently. Of course, I don't think any tribe's ever happy with, with the PA MOA because it means their sites are getting impacted. But 
in this particular case, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, had some great language recognizing and respecting traditional knowledge. Um, they started to dance around the, the role of it in the process um, and about where it would necessarily be included. But we felt in the tribes in the situation really appreciated that the agency was taking this particular step. Um, so just to do a, a brief summary before we, we roll on to questions and I'll see if I missed anything or Valerie wants to jump in. We have an information paper. If you guys don't have it, we can get it out to you. The advisory council has taken the lead in basically stating where TK's role is in the 106 process, but at no point are we defining traditional knowledge. We have been working with Indian tribes and Native Hawaiians for you guys to submit your perspectives on traditional knowledge, your definitions. And that is what is characterizing traditional knowledge in this paper. It's helping outline for the agencies, from the voices of the tribes, from the voices of Native Hawaiians, what it is and how it should be incorporated. And around these examples that the tribes have brought forward and Native Hawaiians, the advisory council's trying to uh, I said, provide some information to agencies on how to incorporate it. And, and we're giving them a few hints on ways that they can work with tribes and some of the concerns that tribes may have, in not only sharing that information, but the reality that it's, it's not as simple as, as a one-stop shop by going to a TIPO and asking them to turn over their traditional knowledge. We really reinforced the agencies. The tribes have procedures. Um, they're part of larger governments. They have cultural protocols. And uh, there's a layer of things that an Indian tribe or a Native Hawaiian organization is going to consider before they transfer this information, before they incorporate it into a regulatory process. Because above all, uh, this traditional knowledge, at least speaking for my tribe, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, it, it's the most important resource that we have is our knowledge about our people. Uh, that we transmit to our youth, it's transmitted by our elders. It's our language, it's our waters, it's you know those archeological remnants out there that are part of those larger sites uh, that we work to protect through the Section 106 process. So I'm gonna quit talking here. Um, I'm gonna see if Valerie wants to jump in and, and say anything, um, but if not, we're ready to move to questions. Thanks, Ira. Um, so I just wanted to note that um, in keeping with the theme of the summit, um, cultural justice for tribes, um, the, the, the ACHP is, has launched this initiative to ensure that um, the wisdom and knowledge that Indigenous peoples bring to federal decision making is appropriately considered by not just federal agencies, but all the other partners in the Section 106 process. Um, as and, and Ira did talk about that. And I also wanted to clarify that um, Ira noted this is a first step. When we, meaning the staff, um, first brought this issue to the council members, you know, that the ACHP is made up of a council of 24 largely presidential appointees and then uh, somewhat less than 40 staff, so Ira and I are part of the professional staff, we brought this issue to membership, and the membership said, you have to start with an information paper, absolutely do not start with guidance. Um, in fact, Shasta, in her capacity as the president of NAFPO, uh, sits on the advisory council, and she, both she and Reno Franklin were adamant about that, that we not start with guidance because this is a very sensitive topic. And you can't launch into guidance when no one but tribes or most people other than tribes, uh, most entities don't understand what it is even. So we had to start with an education component, but we do have a traditional knowledge initiative. And um, when we, finish this paper, we will go back to the membership and say that we heard loudly and clearly from our tribal and Native Hawaiian partners that we need to work on guidance. 
And so that gets at a question that you're asking, Laura, Miranda, um, you know, how agencies acknowledge and consider TK. That's the next step. That's what we will work on next, um, because you're right, they don't have the same understanding or interpretation of what those words mean. And um, we know our partners need us to step into that discussion and uh, answer those questions. Um, so the first step is, what is traditional knowledge? What is special expertise? The second step is, so federal agencies, SHPOs, others in the 106 process, this is what you have to do to acknowledge um, and integrate traditional knowledge into your decision making. Um, we will also do that in partnership with tribes and Native Hawaiians. Um, so that this is, you know, this is a long term initiative. We hope to finish this paper by the end of this year. Um, I think we're almost there. We've, the comments we've been getting from our tribal and Hawaiian partners have more to do with what we need to say in guidance. Um, we are, we're building the paper. Um, if you've seen the paper, you see that there are three pages or so where the ACHP sets the stage and sends the messages I represented about. And then the, the bulk of the paper is information that's either been provided by tribes or that we've taken from intertribal organizations or international organizations like UN bodies. And we're, um, we've begun to collect information from Native Hawaiians as well. It's a living document. We will keep adding to it, but we see a need to put it out there to fill the void. Um, so before we have the guidance, the, the next step completed, you know, we, we address uh, issues like the one you're bringing up, Laura, on a case-by-case -case basis and help federal agencies and tribes and Native Hawaiians navigate. Um, and I see another question. Actually, Valerie, before you, before you answer the, the question, we were gonna wait until everybody oh, that's presented right. until we get into the questions, but I'm glad to see that people are, are asking questions. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I wanna invite Sonia to give her presentation on the work that she's doing with Saving uh, California Stories. So Sonia, go ahead and uh, share your screen and let me know if that doesn't work. I will do your presentation slides for you. Don't forget to unmute. <laughs> Is my screen shared? Not yet. Hmm. Okay, so we don't take up time. Um, Shasta, could you play the PowerPoint I sent to you? Of course. Thank you. All right, just tell me when you want me to move forward. Great. Um, well, first of all, thank you all, uh, particularly uh, Shasta, for having me um, join your um, session and the, um, the workshop uh, in general. I first want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Ohlone lands here on the border between Berkeley and Oakland. Um, I also want to express my um, appreciation um, for your work, all of your work, the TIPOs. I have the highest respect for you and the council and others um, for working with tribes and indigenous groups. Myself, um, many of you know me from my time with the Forest Service as a tribal relations program manager and all. I've been working with tribes and indigenous groups for almost 50 years now. <laughs> um, more recently, I've been working with the Intertribal Timber Council, the National Indian Justice Center, uh, the Native American Heritage Commission. And currently I'm the archives program coordinator for California Institute for Culture, Art and Nature based in the Bay Area. We are looking at how we can better support and protect and perpetuate traditional knowledge that is encoded 
in tribal archives for now and also into the future. Next. Next slide, please. Thanks. There you go. As many of you know, uh, California tribal heritage and knowledge is conveyed by storytellers, elders and others. Um, and that storytelling has supported tribal identity, language, and other aspects of culture. Uh, it's also the foundation for re-indigenizing California and dealing with the effects of trauma and colonization. And this slide illustrates how historical accounts have assisted uh, tribal members uh, to um, reinvent um, the making and the use of traditional uh, Thule boats. Um, traditional knowledge is also brought about um, the, the management of cultural landscapes um, throughout California. Yet many of the archives that contain, that hold uh, tribal traditional knowledge are at risk and they don't enjoy um, the legislative and financial support that other cultural resources have. Next, please. Archives are at risk. Um, I've heard stories of dozens of boxes of cassette tapes and other vulnerable records that are in storage facilities um, waiting for stabilization and digitization. Um, there are photograph albums, letters, and other documents that are losing their identifying labels and context as well. And being we're in California, uh, archives are at risk for fire, floods, and earthquakes. Next, please. Even when the archives and doc other documentary materials are protected, tribes are losing um, the information of where their uh, artifacts and records are housed in many cases. Um, I'm sorry that the slide isn't displaying um, on my screen. I hope it is on yours. But uh, Rick West, uh, the director for the Smithsonian National Center of the American West and currently president and CEO of the Autry uh, National Center of the American West expressed recently in one of our meetings um, that his concern is not only are the creators are slipping away, those who know where it all is are slipping away as well. Next slide, please. The Native American Heritage Commission had published Living Traditions, a museum guide for the Indian people in 1992. This five part series was an index and it contained hundreds of entries of archives and collections in museums, libraries, federal, state and local municipality offices. But the location of these places has not been updated since 1992. And uh, we're looking to see if there's a potential for at least finding out where these archives are off of tribal lands. Next slide, please. We're working with uh, colleagues, um, a working group made up of tribal archivists native curators, representatives from museums, the state library, arts council, and others to address this issue. And we first wanted to start with a survey um, to see what tribal concerns are and, and identify their priorities. Um, we also don't want to just focus on what the needs are. They're vast and many. But many tribes um, have developed workarounds. Many tribes have developed best practices 
that can be shared and be of benefit to others as well. Um, and we don't want to just identify what these best practices and, and needs are, but we want to develop resources and hopefully inform uh, legislative policies, especially in the state, and also develop um, financial and technical support for um, protecting and, and um, furthering uh, archives for the future. Next, please. So many of you may have received an email from me. I tried to reach all the TIPOs and um, major uh, cultural institutions in California asking to please fill out the survey. And we developed many on-ramps for the survey. You can go to the website and there you could download a fillable PDF that 12 questions and people have spent 20 minutes on it and they've also spent two hours because they had a lot to share. You can email me at sonia at californiaican.org or call um, and especially for elders, I've been talking with them on the phone because of the virus. I haven't been able to get together with them, but I have been interviewing them and documenting uh, the information that they want to share about what the priorities are, what documents are at risk, whether it's personal, uh, tribal files, or uh, letters from World War II, or whether they're larger uh, organizational documents uh, to share. So please do get in touch. We've extended the survey due date um, to the 6th of October. If there are problems like more fires or earthquakes or floods, certainly we can extend it again. But uh, we do want to move from identifying the parameters of the issue and looking at what kind of financial and legislative resources we could bring to bear so we can help tribes and others protect and perpetuate their archives now and into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sonia. And um, again, just like the other presentations that we've uh, that, that we've shown and the uh, the various links, we will make those all available to everybody. Um, and uh, I know that at some point the um, the survey link, Sonia, you had put that into the chat. Um, you know, and maybe you can reshare that again now, so it's so it's at the bottom. Uh, you. And you know, so for questions, there were, actually was a question that was for Amy. Uh, that was brought up during the initial panel with with Reed and with Blythe. So I want to uh, scroll back up and find that question. And uh, it's from Alex uh, Watts Tobin. And um, you know, first he he acknowledges the fine work that's being done by the ACHP staff, uh, but uh, he brings up um, that there's been a little concern by tribal members and by by Tipos that the native representatives on the ACHP, uh, like Leonard Forsman and Dorothy Lippert, are no longer on the council. So his question is, is there confidence in native issues from the leadership um, at the top level, you know, now that those folks are gone? It was at 919, if you're looking for his question. Yeah, now we're, <laughs> I saw that pop up when I was attempting to make my kids lunch during their lunch hour. Um, and uh, then I popped back in right as it was sort of ending. But um, no, thanks for the question. Um, as I kind of uh, alluded to earlier, obviously I'm getting to benefit from being there on a full-time basis and having you know the, the expertise of a staff as chair. So that's one of the eight appointed members that didn't have that kind of um, you know uh, ease to 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 get um, um, you know better educated on. On the Native American Affairs Office and our interactions with with tribes and tipos and and uh, and then how federal agencies interact. 
Um, luckily, we know where Dorothy is. <laughs> she's luckily, she's close by to us here in town. Um, we, I def we definitely feel her loss of not being a member of the council. Um, of course, the National Historic Preservation Act dictates that um, members can only serve two terms. Um, and so she did um, complete two terms. And, um, and, and by law, they can't even come back <laughs> in another administration for have you. Like it, it's two, whether it's consecutive or, or not, two terms is, is, is the limit. Um, and I, I did have to find that out the hard way, uh, sadly. Um, but, um, but yes, Leonard, um, you know, it was a great benefit that I got to overlap with him a bit um, for, you know, over a year. Um, got to know him even before I, I, I hopped on board um, officially. Um, I guess the beauty of our council is that we do have staggered terms um, too for, for that. Um, and of course, you know, we got the Native American, um, Native Hawaiian organization member, um, but also along with the position of, um, you know, chair being full-time um, as of the 2016, um, I guess, amendments, um, it brought on full-time NAFPO as, uh, as a full member of the council. I think previously it had been um, an observer member. Um, so um, thanks to that, I've gotten to know, you know, Shasta, um, the jack of all trades here, um, well and have <laughs> um, really enjoyed um, interaction um, uh, with that um, full interaction. Um, so yeah, it's a, it, it's a challenge. So there are eight appointed members um, that are either expert or general public. And so um, it's, it's a, it's a process that I only wish I had <laughs> more um, control over, but of course it is, um, is in any administrations through the White House um, Presidential Personnel Office. And um, luckily I've uh, in here in Washington to navigate that whole process and, and definitely offer my um, um, advice to and help um, you know locate uh, potential candidates for for these roles and um, again you know full-time chair hasn't quite um, always had that capacity they our previous chairs have um, in certain ways but um, Again, I know where they are close by, but um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's the nature. I mean, I'm chair. I'm only one member of the council, of course, as chair, and so I do. Uh, everybody, all 24 statutory members, um, although we have 23 of the spots filled, um, you know, is is a valued member and brings a perspective. And we do now have, I guess, in this year alone, three new members, um, four four <laughs> on the way. And we're trying to take that opportunity to do a full blown briefing for them as they're kind of sort of coming in all at one time now. Um, and uh, of course the, the pandemic challenges of getting it all together, which like we normally typically do at least three times a year has, has um, made that a challenge. But actually next month, I'm going to personally travel to two of them. <laughs> and in my hand have a wide range of briefing materials for them. And it's been the only way um, to, to get this moving is if I just go to them at this point. So that's what I'm doing. And um, again, I've, I've got you know, some great materials from the Office of Native American Affairs and all of you know, Ira's wonderful presentations and what have you. And, and of course, all the resources on their web links. So um, um, again, we're all operating into <laughs> some unusual circumstances, and we're also operating with, you know, the, the realities of, of, um, of how we all operate. So um, I guess it's the best I can answer that. I wish I had more say, of course, um, but as one member and as a member of a very, um, you know, large federal government and a very small little <laughs> agency that we are, small but mighty, um, uh, I'm working hard. Thanks, Amy. And I see that Alex has put himself on video. So Alex, did you want to follow up? No, I just wanted to say I appreciate that answer um, very much. And um, I just wanted to draw people's attention to, yeah, I feel this rather consciously being a non-native person working as a SIPO myself and uh, trying to educate the general public and people in high positions. So I just wanted to draw people's attention to um, the great chat contributions by Bill Tritt. Um, which you have seen, who is my boss, and you may have heard him. Uh, uh, you've seen his editorial in The Guardian. You may have heard him on NPR's Science Friday recently. If you haven't, you should check it out. Thank you. 
Thanks, Alex. Yeah, so, and, um, yes, go ahead, Valerie. <laughs> so if I could further elaborate for Alex um, and for everyone in the audience, the ACHP has a requirement that all staff have to go through training with the Office of Native American Affairs because we take very seriously our responsibility as um, the staff that informs the federal decision makers. Um, we also do training for the members on their responsibilities, their trust responsibilities, government to government responsibilities, um, you know, upholding treaties, et cetera. So ACHP does take that seriously. I understand where the concern is coming from about the makeup of the council, but like any other federal agency, we understand that we're a federal agency and we have those responsibilities to tribes and Native Hawaiians. And so um, we hold regular trainings. And in fact, um, before Dorothy left, um, she gave the staff, um, she had an hour long discussion with the staff about tribal issues. Reno also, when he was in DC the last time, did the same thing. So we offer regular, um, not just formal training, but regular opportunities for staff and the members to learn more. So, um, so we, we are doing what we can. Thank you. Thanks, Valerie. And um, you know, as, as bringing it back to the, um, the traditional knowledge paper, I, I want to point out, you know, it has been a long time. Uh, and, um, oh, and also, as far as the makeup of the council is concerned, the, the chair of NAFPO is an ex officio member, which means that whoever is in this position is on the ACHP, and there are no term limits. If I keep getting uh, reelected as the chair, then I will continue to be on the advisory council. Um, so I'm, I, we were tentatively going to have an in-person business meeting next week. Uh, in DC, and uh, we, that's not happening now because of the travel restrictions. But I had it on my calendar, and I was ready to go out there in person, take a four-hour flight, so I could be there for four hours, just to show that you know you, you uh, the administration's not going to get rid of the native uh, representatives uh, that easily. <laughs> so, uh, um, but we're not we're not traveling now because DC is not letting uh, people come in. But uh, uh, on the traditional knowledge side of things, I remember we had a meeting in person, one of the business meetings, and I think it was in the Native American Affairs Committee meeting, or might have been federally, federal agency programs, and we were talking about the traditional knowledge paper, and I said, I can write the paper for you. This is what the paper, and Valerie's nodding because she remembers this, this is what the paper is going to say. Page one, traditional knowledge is whatever tribes say it is. End of paper. <laughs> Um, and uh, that's not a question so much as, as it's, it's an observation. And as some people are mentioning in the comments, it's not traditional knowledge. It's traditional knowledges, plural. Just like it's not Native American culture, it's Native American cultures, plural. So that's, that, and that makes it hard. And I think that that's what some of our questions are about, like Laura's question, Valerie, that you addressed, uh, or her comment that when you're looking to get deeper, as she wrote, into how agencies acknowledge and consider tribal traditional knowledge, because tribal communities and agencies often have very in di different interpretations of those words. Um, so that makes it a little more complicated. Um, and uh, Valerie, you did address that. And Ira, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add about that. Um. Just broadly, I want to say some things. Who knows how relevant it is, but <laughs> I, I, you know, I served as TIPO a long time. I've done tribal government, federal government for over 20 years, most of it for my tribe. And one of the things the advisory council is doing is, you know, with the traditional knowledge papers, we're balancing it because you're bringing up a lot of other points out there about the awareness of Indian tribes. Part of what we struggle with still is reminding federal agencies that, yeah, each tribe is unique and distinct, uh, not just because an Indian tribe is a political entity, it's a political relationship with the United States. They are a sovereign entity, but they have a unique culture, unique background, unique language, and they need to respect them as such. So it starts with simple things like recognizing each individual tribe separately when you're communicating with them. Don't just call them tribes and call out each specific federal agency. 
you need to show them the respect that they deserve. But also when you get into these properties of religious and cultural significance, traditional cultural properties, that's not one traditional cultural property that all the tribes share. They might have, they might all be in one geographic area, but they are unique to those tribes uh, or tribe that ascribes that significance to them. So there are a lot of things that we're working to educate them on. And uh, I think I want to tie this back to the training that Valerie and I, Bill Dancing Feather, we do with tribes, is this is where we relate to the tribes a lot, that this is where your role comes into the process. It's being aware that the federal agencies do not have this knowledge. So that consultation definition where it is a process, that's your opportunity to help show them what they need to do, to tell them what's necessary in identification, uh, tell them how they should be documenting things and what might be an effect from the undertaking. So we're fighting from the advisory council to make sure they recognize your role in the process, that unique element of each individual tribe. And unlike Shasta said, in this paper, we're trying to make it very clear that when it gets to traditional knowledge, it's not a definition that the advisory council has or the park service or their agency, it's what the tribe says it is. So it's, we're balancing a few of those things in here. And I think that's, um, we're working on a lot of those concerns that you guys expressed are there. It's just, there's a lot of federal agency personnel, a lot of agencies, and we're looking to change cultures a little bit. Uh, we're looking to change guidance documents. And as you guys are getting into it here, small things, terms, words, little things like that and how they might be interpreted we're, be, we're being very careful with it to make sure that we in the drafting this paper don't cause another issue we don't want to you know solve one and create two of them so uh we're aware but but what we're hearing here today is exactly what we need because in dc very easy for us to lose the forest through the trees you know, we're not out there every day. I spent a lot of years out there, better part of two decades, but these days things can slip by us. Don't be shy about emailing us, calling us, sharing your perspectives, and not just about traditional knowledge initiative during your case or your undertakings that you're working with, or just if you feel you have any sort of knowledge or perspective that's going to educate the staff in DC because the advisory council is small and it is an agency where if you're going to interact with us you can influence and you can help educate and make those kinds of changes that are going to be productive especially when you compare it to a place like the park service that has 20,000 employees that, 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 that's a big lift um, but for the advisory council you can help shape the future uh, and I think like you see it here you have the appointee the chairman you have a director. I'm just a staff person, I'm not as important. But you have two important people here um, and actually another council member. So uh, there's great opportunities in this. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Ira. Um, and going through the comments, uh, I know you might be doing that on your own, uh, our, our panelists. Um, Sonia, there were some great comments for you, thanking you for the work that, that you're doing. Um, Courtney Coyle, uh, she's the outside counsel for United Auburn. Uh, had some good news that the state of California just adopted a definition of tribal traditional knowledge uh, relative to updates for the Cal NAGPRA statute. And we're going to have two panels tomorrow, actually, because this is such an important issue for California tribes on, um, on NAGPRA and, and what's going on with the UC system and, and the Cal NAGPRA statute. So I, I'm sure she'll elaborate on that then. Um, uh, but just uh, says so she appreciates the efforts of the ACHP and uh, Chairman Giorgiani uh, joining us today. Uh, and we have a question from Sita Reddy. Can you provide suggestions to reconcile regulation requirements on landscape boundaries versus traditional knowledge and perspectives, which rarely include definitive boundaries as required by Euro-Americans? And if you want to find that in the chat, it's at 1031. <laughs> Sometimes it's easier to read it yourself than to have it read to you. 
Um, Shasta, I'll, I'll take that question, and, and it's a really good one. Um, ACHP is aware of, those, of that disconnect. Um, we've been aware of it for some time um, and um, have been having conversations back and forth with the National Register uh, of Historic Places for a long time. Um, it's really a question that has to be addressed by them. ACHP doesn't um, participate in discussions about boundaries. Um, that's, you know, the, what's determined to be eligible and how big they are and the different worldviews that feed into that consideration is not done with the Advisory Council. Um, so I think it's a really good question and I think it is worth taking to the National Register at the National Park Service. Um, because some of what all of us might be able to resolve in the Section 106 process is hampered by that disconnect, and it, it is something that's critically important to address. Um, so that's the best I can offer. Sorry. But that's, oh, that's not the, it's not the ACHP. Hey, Ira? Yeah, I just wanted to say from a practice perspective would be that if you're are having to deal with those boundary issues, it, especially if you are essentially defining a boundary that you're either uncomfortable with or you don't feel is representative, but it might be necessary for that undertaking at hand, clearly have the agency document that you are defining those boundaries in relation to that undertaking and those specific circumstances. So if it comes up again in another undertaking, that agency doesn't see those as agreed upon, final boundaries. They will see that those are basically uh, tentative, and I apologize, my computer's playing in, but those are always things to document, and that even includes if you are talking about significance and integrity, doing it one time for one undertaking, agencies will see that and apply it in another undertaking and not necessarily always think that there's additional information the tribe hasn't shared. So just try to get any of that down there. Always think about the next time somebody's going to look at that and like what disclaimer you would want them to read so that next undertaking the agency or even the advisory council can say hey the tribe was clear that they only shared the information you know relevant to this undertaking or these potential adverse effects that's supposed to be what happens in the 106 process they're supposed to talk to you but you can guarantee it's going to be clear if you have it articulated the first time. Um, it's just a bit of a safety thing for you to possibly to take into account. We've seen it happen numerous times. Um, so hopefully that'll help. Thanks, Ira. And uh, Sonia, I see you have your hand up, so go ahead. Yes. Um, you know, based on my experience um, with multiple agencies over multiple decades, I would recommend that tribes get involved in the land management planning process so that the focus is how should this area be managed? It's significant for different reasons, but we're not looking at hard boundaries. The focus is on the management, the care. Um, the Forest Service in California is updating its management plans, and I don't have the exact schedule anymore, uh, for 18 million acres. And this is an opportunity to look at the macro level instead of each individual project and its impacts, which you also have to do, but start looking at setting the foundation that this area should be managed for its traditional cultural values. This is how it should be taken care of, uh, perhaps in collaboration uh, with the tribe, and we've got many examples in the state for that kind of a collaboration. So a suggestion. Thank you, Sonia. And that actually, uh, you know, I'm going out of order now, that, that comes into a, a comment and a question from Laura Miranda. Um, she says, in California, it would be wonderful to have something like a base inventory of traditional or cultural places mm -hmm. and how many have been lost or substantially impacted coupled with documentation of the places at different chronological periods, including the present. 
they are being lost so quickly and there is no effort to understand the overall disconnection and loss to the tribal communities um, which is not enough effort um, at then that comment at 1049 uh, but what do you think about that idea i think if a tribe wants to do it and um, I'll hold that knowledge and share some of it. Um, it would be good. Um, the agency doesn't need to know everything about why it's significant or culturally important. Um, they need to respect tribal sovereignty and the um, knowledge that uh, traditional practitioners have about how it should be managed but i think it would be very useful for a tribe to do that inventory um, with elders and do that documentation and protect that information uh, for now into the future thank you uh, and actually another question from laura so thank you laura for your great questions and this is um uh, back to the uh, the achp uh, that she hasn't reviewed the paper yet, but I, I think that maybe because it's not out for review yet. Is that is that right, Valerie? It, it's it's only been reviewed by um, Indian tribes, Native Hawaiians, and intertribal organization. Um, it, it's not out. It, it it'll be published in at towards the end of the year. Okay, so, so correct question. Shasta. Her question is about the uh, uh, cultural competency training for agencies and folks that are consulting with tribes and actually incorporating the tribal traditional knowledge. That's a that's a spectacular idea, um, and there's been a lot of discussion about cultural competency training um, in federal interagency working groups, um, with the recognition that we can't do it ourselves. Um, so. Um, I would just say, um, please let me know who's interested in doing it with the ACHP. I'd love to launch something like that, but I also don't see that as coming from the federal government. I think we could facilitate it, but cultural competency training has to be done by indigenous peoples. Um, so I'm happy to uh, talk about that and uh, Shasta, we can bring that up. Um, in the Native American Affairs Committee, and and thankfully my chairman is hearing this suggestion. <laughs> so, so, so thank you so much for that recommendation, Laura. Well, and I, I agree with you on the uh, it needs to be done by the right folks. You know, you don't want to trust the federal. I shouldn't put it that way, but I will anyway. You don't want to trust a federal agency. I mean, it's not it's not necessarily in their interest. Uh, to do that in a way that's going to be uh, best serving the the tribes but i still i would say that i think the federal government should pay for it uh, so there needs to be funding for that and it sounds like a perfect initiative for NAFPO. so i will just uh yep. stick that in my my head and and think about that um and uh, there there have been multiple comments here i i won't read them out but i i'm going to suggest after what alex said to look for bill trips comments um, starting at 1034. Um, although, uh, Mr. Tripp, if you are still with us, I'm looking for you, yes. Uh, if you like, I can um, I can allow you to unmute yourself if you'd like to make some of your comments to the entire group by audio. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you uh, the allow to talk. And actually now I just see you just disappeared from my list of panelists or my list of attendees. So I don't know can, what. Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. Yes, go ahead. Oh yeah, I, I was just wanting to point out that um, in the traditional gathering policy uh, that was developed years back, and I believe Sonia was, was part of that effort. Um, uh, it, it involved, um, yeah, uh, provisions for doing some pruning, burning, and coppicing uh, for managing basket materials, um, and um, and gathering those uh, resources uh, without consideration was the was the term that was used. Um, and so uh, it says agreements are encouraged but not required, and a lot of other things like that. Um, but we we um, met with 
with the forest and said, well, uh, it says that we could do this without consideration. And so uh, that means that you don't have to do NEPA. And, and so I just wanna call to attention uh, how people look at words differently. Um, and so the response was, uh, that no, um, without consideration means that we don't have to pay for a permit. And so, um, you know, words are defined in different places um, and have different meanings in different contexts. And so I also added in there a definition I just pulled off of an internet search on how it's defined in contract law, which would then be potentially attributed back to uh, whatever's in any any treaties or or uh, agreements um, that are made uh, with the federal government. And, you know, I can't say I'm, a, I'm an attorney and just exactly what that language means, but this could be how some people are considering the use of that word consider or consideration. Um, and, ha and it could be uh, being interpreted as, as a financial uh, construct. Um, so I just was wondering if anyone was, was looking into the, those differences in, in regard to the context of, of the use of, of that word in particular. So specifically the, the, the use of the word consideration? Yeah, because I mean, it, you know, it says acknowledge or, and consider. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the um, you know, I, I begun the comment with, with uh, the indigenous knowledge, practice, and belief systems are, are uh, rooted in uh, with practice at its center. And so if that could be uh, potentially interpreted to uh, the federal agencies uh, must acknowledge that, that the indigenous people should be engaged in the practice um, or the knowledge is lost um, and uh, consider as in, in the financial uh, terms to fund. Um, and so, you know, I mean, there may be some potential there. Yeah, I think from a, a, a legal standpoint, it is important to define those words. And I do think, you know, consideration, that is part of contract law, that consideration includes uh, a promise of service, you know, in, in exchange for some sort of, of payment. Um, I mean, I can't speak to that, but I don't, I don't, I suspect that that's not how consideration is being defined. But it's an interesting question, um, just to make sure of it. But yeah, it, it, you... that was their answer when we asked them, and so oh. it just brought up questions in my mind. That that's okay. How the Forest Service was 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 uh, interpreting the use. That was the Forest Service's interpretation. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Um, these are all things for us to be to be you know considering, and, and I'm glad that you put that in a comment too. Um, you were uh, a little quiet there, so I think it might have been uh, hard for for people to hear everything. Um, and maybe this is something too that can that can come up in our Forest Service panel, which is going to be, I believe, is that this afternoon? I'm losing track of time. <laughs> Um, so another another question that we had here uh, came from uh, Laverne Bill. And he was asking, can you expand on the NRCS relationship and how traditional ecological knowledge helps them interact with the tribes better? Uh, and do you have an example of how that has worked on a project? And that might be a question for you, Ira, because I think you've done some NRCS work, right? Yeah, I was, well, I was at the advisory council, but I was liaison to the NRCS. Uh, so what that document that the NRCS drafted, you know, with their working group, it was essentially a lot like what we're doing here. Uh, the NRCS realized that their staff did not have the foundational knowledge necessary uh, to be able to consult with Indian tribes. The question of what are ancestral lands? How do you consult with tribes? They were inconsistent. Um, at this time, the NRCS was making a lot of changes. They had moved to a, a prototype pro uh, agreement programmatic agreement to try to get some consistency to their operations. Uh, that document was essentially a first step for them where they were getting that baseline information out there and it was a bit more targeted to their agency about their nine step decision making process, et cetera. Uh, their next step in this document is actually going out and developing some agreements with tribes about doing consultation on an Indian tribe's ancestral lands, basically off reservation, um, and trying to find 
some consistency for their operations, realizing that Indian tribes aren't confined to state boundaries, which was a way the NRCS had operated prior to this guidance. They still operate that way, but they were one of the agencies uh, that was guilty of the fact that when they did outreach on consultation, they didn't go outside their state boundaries. Um, so I don't know how many examples they have of success right now, but that for them was a building block. I know NAFPO has got uh, an agreement to work with them now. It's been hampered a bit by COVID, but it was supposed to bring NRCS staff and Indian tribes together to start talking about consultation on ancestral lands and what the tribe's perspectives are, how that traditional knowledge should be incorporated into their decision-making process. So uh, that too is evolving and um, California, um, I know you guys got, a, I think in the last year or two, you've gotten a newer NRCS state archeologist. I had worked with the prior one. Um, all I can say is it's, it's good to see them turn over a new leaf there with their archeologist, um, but they're archeologist heavy. That means they don't have a dynamic like the park service or the forest service. They don't have anthropologists uh, they don't have people to do ethnography. So there's gonna be a lot of education that's necessary for that agency. Despite the statement in that ancestral lands document, it still needs to be implemented. So hopefully in the next coming months, I've been working with Valerie Grusing, where um, you know, the NAFPO executive director at getting, to working towards some of these agreements. Um, the other thing NRCS is considering developing their own internal training for their staff specifically on this topic. This is one of those agencies that's got a lot of staff, uh, a lot of nation, um, and a strong mission to support people like farmers and people on private property. So there's a lot of unique components in there that they're balancing, but your uh, specific statement there, I'm probably gonna copy and paste that, and I'm gonna bring it forward to some of their staff because I think now they have the document it's time to kind of put up or shut up for them in the sense that let's start to see what kind of action is going to follow and who can lead that way. And there might be some examples uh, out there. I just, I don't have them. So I'm sorry for the long answer, but I kind of wanted to give you the big picture there and let you know that NAFPO is involved. And hopefully in the next year, NAFPO, if I can stay involved in some capacity, we'll be reaching out and building on this in the same way that the ACHP is trying to get that firsthand tribal experience and developing some items that can actually help um, be kind of cutting edge in the industry as far as putting traditional knowledge and the tribe's thoughts, needs, and expressions in the front of that decision-making versus on the back end where it traditionally has been for so much of the 106 process. Thank you, Ira, that's a really great comprehensive answer. Um, I think you need to mute yourself because somehow I'm getting feedback from you. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, it, it gives me some thoughts as, as well about all the different agencies that tribes need to deal with, but how those agencies themselves don't always think about their responsibilities to tribes. And, and you brought up a few, you know, there's NRCS, there's the park service, there's, you know, the forest service, BLM, which we have you know, good and bad, depending on which district you happen to be in. But in the last couple of days, my inbox has been full of notifications from the Army Corps of Engineers and from the EPA about the issuing of the new nationwide permits and being done two years early. Um, and uh, these are about, it, it's about clean water. You know, so I'm receiving those things because I'm the environmental director for Paula, not just the TIPO. But I see those things and I also consider what are the effects of these, of that new nationwide permit? What is the effect on the 401 certifications? What is the effect of the new uh, regulations on the nationwide permits that are now saying that you only need a nationwide permit for linear projects? Pipeline projects, for example, let's say that the area of effect on a pipeline is, you know, 20, 20 yards to either side of the pipeline. So you think, okay, that's not much of an area of potential effect. So what are the tribes going to have to say about that? We don't need a nationwide, or we don't need an individual permit 
we need just a nationwide permit for that. But a pipeline might be 2,000 miles long or 1,000 miles or even 100 miles. But even that, I don't know what 100 miles times 40 yards equals as far as acreage because Shasta don't do math. But <laughs> uh, it's, it's a lot. So what are your thoughts about that sort of an issue when it comes to traditional knowledge if the agencies are not going to be required to do 106? You know, I think Shasta, the simple answer is if agencies aren't going to do 106, tribes aren't going to have a voice. It's pretty obvious. That's why we um, push uh, effective, meaningful tribal consultation. It's why we train federal agencies constantly. It's why we have an, a, an enormous volume of guidance to help agencies improve their consultation. Um, I will say that I don't think, I think the ACHP just learned about those nation, that nationwide permit as well. Um, I suspect the issue having to do with linear projects is to resolve the fact that I think it's nationwide permit number 12 was shot down in the courts. Um, so, you know, they, and there are just so many things that we can keep up with as well. Um, I, I just found out about it from Kerry Cloutier at the Pamunkey tribe. Um, so we haven't really looked at what the nationwide permit, this current nationwide permit says. Um, but, um, you know, just on a, you know, just off the top of my head, I would have to say that unless the core has in-house knowledge, well, actually the way Nationwides are set up, it doesn't even require the core to have in-house. Uh, it means there's no review period even by the core. Um, but um, that means there's no voice for tribes in that decision making, period. Right. Which yep. is which is my take on it as well. So I'm for those of you listening, um, be aware that that's they, that that's out for review right now. The renewal of the nationwide permits, and so that's a, a place where we can make our comments on that. And you know, not to put too uh, too subtle a point on it, the reason for that that change is because linear projects tend to be things like pipelines, oil pipelines, natural gas pipelines, um, Dakota Access was a linear project. Uh, and so I, I can't help but be cynical about what the, uh, the purpose is of making a, a change in the nationwide permits that don't expire for two years right as there is an election coming up. Um, so be aware, uh, if you have environmental staff and you're not seeing those notifications yourselves, ask your environmental staff uh, or your your tribal leaders who should be getting these letters um, to make sure that cultural staff are are aware. But that gets us a little bit away from you know the original intent here, which was to talk about the traditional knowledge paper. So uh, in our in our last uh, eight minutes or so, I, I wonder if uh, if any of you would like to comment on what sorts of responses you have received from the tribes on the work you've done so far and how it may have changed your approach to the traditional knowledge paper. The response has been um, overwhelmingly positive. Um, and um, we, we've made it, um, we, we have changed the part that's written by the ACHP. It has changed in sort of tone and, um, and a little bit of content. It, it's, so it's what we say is a federal agency, but it's been shaped by uh, tribal and native Hawaiian comments um, to be, to, so, because we needed to be certain that what we were saying was in no way disrespectful or diminishes anything. Um, and, you know, we all know that words carry heavy weight. So, um, so we have made a considerable number of revisions to the paper based on uh, the feedback we've gotten, and one uh, big change we made to it was to add uh, articles from the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to the paper to add more weight to what we were saying, and because the ACHP has a plan to support the declaration anyway. So, um, 
we've this is probably the initiative where we've had the most feedback from tribes and Native Hawaiians. Um, and it's been consistent throughout the initiative. Um, people seem excited about it, are very invested in it, and um, I'm not even sure the regulations got this much attention. <laughs> so, so it tells us that it was needed, it's overdue, um, and that's why we're anxious to publish this and get on with step two, which is to, to help agencies do things like appropriately take into account what tribes say, uh, you know, the information the tribes share. So, so it's been really exciting to work on this um, and for all these minds to come together. It tells us that, um, you know, we were on the right path to do this in the first place. Thanks, Shasta. Sure. And um, Ira, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's a pretty good summary right there. I'll, uh, I'll have more comments soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you got like uh, five minutes to, to make them. Um, and um, Sonia, I wonder if you want to uh, make any comments on um, you know, some of the feedback you've gotten so far for your initiative. We're hearing um, from uh, a number of tribes, uh, tribal organizations and elders um, that um, we have to look beyond um, existing law and regulation. Um, there's a lot of appreciation for Section 106 and also parallel uh, California legislation, but there's so many sites that are being excavated. There's so many artifacts being stored. There's so many interviews with elders and traditional practitioners that are getting documented. And yet they reside in various warehouses. And um, there's, once the project is over, who is going to maintain, care, uh, transfer the knowledge that lies within these records, within these artifacts? Um, how can they be properly taken care of? Uh, what is the um, legal, institutional, and financial responsibilities to take care of our tangible and intangible uh, cultural resources beyond the project. Um, so um, these are darn good questions <laughs> and we are going to be uh, looking at it um, uh, with the consortium that we're developing with tribal leaders, uh, tribal archivists, native curators, uh, elders and others. But I'm sharing more in news from Native California, uh, uh, which is a periodical that reaches a lot of California Indian country here in the state and also in other forums. And I'll do a better job on my PowerPoint next time. And <laughs> and no, you were, you were fine. And thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for converting it into uh into Word or into PowerPoint because I couldn't open it in Keynote. So, <laughs> so thank Your you for that. Old. That, it's, it's okay. You, sh you should see me trying to talk my mom to returning something on Amazon. I was on the phone with her for 20 minutes the other day. Oh yeah. Good times. Um, Thanks for your help, Shasta. <laughs> sure. Um, so with the two minutes remaining, um, I want to give um, Chairman Giorgiani a chance if she wants to say any, any concluding remarks about what we've discussed. Uh, thanks so much. Um, I'm going to actually try to do it in 30 seconds, if that's okay. okay. Um, <laughs> I um, uh, just thank you so much for having me today. Um, I know um, I've seen a little inside glimpse of the process um, with our Office of Native American Affairs in this effort. And um, so glad that we're able to, um, to have this discussion today um, with all the folks in California. Um, so thank you for having this on the agenda. And good luck with the rest of your conference. And everybody, please stay safe. Thank you. Uh, and um, Ira or Valerie, any, any concluding remarks? Ira, you said you had some stuff, so go ahead. 
I'll keep it simple. I just want to say, I think building off of what Sonia was saying, I think there definitely is a need for tribes, not only in this paper, but broadly look toward the future. Uh, the, the, how quickly tribal sovereignty was eroded versus how difficult and incremental progress in, in preserving and establishing tribal rights, uh, that's kind of disparaging to take into account. But same way that this paper is foundational, we're working towards a future that we can incorporate it in. I just think tribes, you need to look out and take into account opportunities under state law, um, the land planning, even from county ordinances. We're one piece of the puzzle. We have federal undertakings that the ACHP is, is working in, but we're advisory and we cannot dictate to agencies what they can do. So we're going to do everything we can, but definitely we're a tool in the toolbox. And even within that, that's really what this informational paper and any subsequent products are going to be. So uh, do your best to, to try to help us make this as good as possible, uh, but figure out the next steps, not only for us to take, uh, but yourselves and, and just kind of leverage each other. This is uh, a long-term struggle that we as tribal people are participating in, and I just wish everybody the best of luck going forward. Thanks, Aaron. I'll, I'll, give, your, I'll give your director, uh, Valerie, the final word. Thank you, Shasta. I just want to say thank you for the invitation to, to be with everybody today. Thanks for everyone sharing their thoughts uh, with us, and I just enjoy the rest of the conference, and I wish you all um, health and safety as you uh, for all my California friends. I'll keep you in my prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And now that's it for, uh, for this panel. Uh, everybody, it's lunch break. We will be back at the dot of 1230 uh, for our next panel, which is the Caltrans and Federal Highways Administration. So we'll see you in 60 minutes. <laughs>